in the windscreen to watch out for obstacles and map the road. And inside, possibly the most important feature of any test autonomous car, emergency red stop button. But is driving in China any different to driving anywhere else in the world? Well, to get a sense of the actual technology you'd need to navigate in Beijing traffic, I was taken for a ride by that famous Chinese company, Volvo. Quite a bit of the technology that we will find in autonomous cars already exists and is already in cars that you can buy today. This one, for example, can keep a safe distance from the car in front and it can keep in lane as long as it can see good lane markings either side of it. Not that we have much opportunity to use those features here. I wouldn't call it chaos. Everyone did seem to know what they were doing. Everyone except me. I don't even know how many lanes there are here. We seem to be like... <laughs> if you're an autonomous car, you need to deal with this. You need to deal with this chap. You need to deal with the man that came past a few minutes ago selling turtles to drivers. <laughs> So, a little way to go then before we hit this sexy vision of the future. Chinese video streaming company Le TV says it is developing its own self-driving car. Why? Because in the future, what else will we be doing in our autonomous cars than watching its TV and movie service? Hmm. Certainly looks like it will cost a fortune. And yes, that is a problem. Autonomous cars are expensive to develop and will be filled with expensive components. But interestingly, this car, developed by UIC, a company founded by our good friend Gansha Wu, is dispensing with the very expensive LiDAR and inertial sensors and using cheaper stereo cameras to help it see in a different way. Actually, we have an interesting metaphor. So Google has pretty good eyesight based on all the sensors. So it has an eyesight of 2.0. So they don't need to be very smart. Probably they have an IQ of 120. But for us, we want to have an eyesight of 1.5 with an IQ of 180. We actually build an, a supercomputer in the car. All of this traffic is contributing to another big problem here, pollution. In 1978, there were just 1.3 million vehicles on China's roads. Today, there are 279 million. The smog is sometimes so bad, it's breathtaking. You can see the haze kind of over there, but you'll get a much better idea from the top of this building here. Right, so now you can see it, can't you? There's the Olympic Tower, the water cube, and the Bird's Nest Olympic Stadium. There are mountains over there, trust me. Not that you've got a chance of seeing them today. It's up here that I'm meeting IBM's chairman in China, Li Ming Chen, who has his eye on a cleaner future. We normally use 1978 as a kind of benchmark. That's the year China opened up. Right. If you look at the population at 1978, and our population was only 960 million. Today we have a 1.35 billion population. The net increase is almost 400 million. So whenever you have a population increase, then you have energy consumption. No doubt about that. Couple that massive growth in population, traffic and industry with the fact that China's main fossil fuel is the one that produces the most CO2 coal and you can see why the horizon is so grey. Previous attempts to turn it blue again have involved shutting down everything, factories and traffic in the whole Beijing area for four weeks in the run-up to the 2008 Olympics. But IBM has developed a smarter way to manage pollution and turn the horizon green. This is the home of the Green Horizon Project, a massive undertaking to predict where and how bad the pollution will be 10 days ahead. 
Not only does Green Horizon help predict which areas will be hit worst, it can predict the environmental and economic effects of different pollution management strategies, from shutting down certain factories to banning traffic in different areas. Now, an enormous amount of data is being analysed here, coming from ground sensors, satellites, weather forecasts, geographic information, traffic data and factory emission monitoring. Green Horizon is even learning how to read comments and pictures on social media. Social media can help us to quickly locate some of the pollution uh, events. There's some other leaking um, or illegal emissions, so we can use the social media data to help uh, the uh, city manager to quickly find out those pollution sources. This project is already active in several cities in China and it's being piloted in New Delhi and Johannesburg too. I've been gobsmacked at just how stunning Beijing is. But it's going to take an awful lot of work to keep the air clear enough 